Good morning, Bethany. Happy New Year's. Someone said it passed. Well, it depends on how you look at it, right? <clears throat> a new beginning can also be a new year for someone, right? And so it's important to be thankful for that. This morning, I want to talk to you about something that I think we will all relate to. I hope so. I titled the sermon, Joy of a Father. Now, in this room, many of us have kids. We're married. Some are single. But wives, have you experienced the joy of your husband? When he's joyful, nothing's going to stop him. He's going to wake everyone up in the morning. He's going to make breakfast that's probably not that tasty, but it will be the best breakfast because the joy is present, it's there, and everyone can feel that joy. They can see that joy. Now what happens if the opposite is part of the morning routine? Well, sometimes you don't want anything. You just want to go, maybe finish off the day, and hopefully tomorrow will bring something better. Now I want us to look at chapter, um, Luke chapter 15, and we're going to reflect on this whole chapter actually, um, and we're going to look at, in this chapter there's three stories that are told, three parables, and each parable ends in joy, it ends with a message that I want us to take with today. First parable that Jesus tells, and we know that he's speaking to the tax collectors, sinners, and the Pharisees that were there. He talks about the parable of a lost sheep. And he tells this wonderful story of a shepherd who leaves his 99, and what does he do? He goes and gets and finds this lost sheep. He finds it, comes back, and we see in verse 7, he goes and gets all his neighbor's friends and he rejoices because during that time, a sheep was valuable. The fur or its wool, I should say, and everything else with it. This is the second party that we see here is the parable of a woman who loses a coin. Now I want you to understand that during that time, more than likely, the 10 silver coins were a value of someone's savings account, maybe. Maybe it could last them a few months, a few weeks. And in most cases, most people actually wore a little bag around their neck, and they kept what was precious next to them, because they could feel that, and they knew that it was there. And so when this coin went missing, she probably clearly understood, it's gone. And so she sweeps her house, she finds this coin, and what does she do? She has a party, if we can call it like that. She rejoices, she goes and invites her neighbors, and she wants to rejoice with them, because that one coin, even though she had nine, she found it, and it has value for her. Now, the third parable Jesus tells us is about a son who was lost and who was found. Even better, a son who was dead, and now he is alive again. And we see that a father puts on a great celebration. He invites the whole village to celebrate the life of his son who came back. These are great celebrations. They're wonderful events where they bring joy. And this parable, these parables, they illustrate the joy of our Father in heaven. The first parable in verse 7, we see that Jesus says that in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Jesus illustrates in the same manner that this 
person who found this one sheep, he rejoices because of the value it has returned back to this shepherd. Even though he had the 99, there was value in this one. In verse 10, we see the second story or the second parable. In the same way, I tell you, at the end of it, Jesus says, in the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. We can draw a conclusion that all celebrations symbolize a great big celebration of one sinner who repents. Now we know that scripture is very clear and God, God has no joy in death of a wicked person. We are told through the book of Ezekiel that I have no pleasure in death of the wicked. God has no joy over judging sinners but he does find his joy in salvation of the sinners. Now I want to take you back to the story in Luke 15. And I want you just to try to imagine to the best of your ability with me. During that time, we're going to go way back. Middle East, probably hot. Everyone doesn't have these massive big houses. No air conditioning more than likely. But there are a couple of principles that were probably the same then and they're the same now. People looked after their families. They looked after their livestock. They looked after their name. Culture had a big impact. Shame was a big factor. Honor was a big factor. And I think the same applies today. Whatever is honorable you do, or you pursue it, you avoid all things at all costs, anything that brings shame onto yourself or your family. This has always been like that, and it will be like that. You do what's honorable, you avoid what's shameful. If you can understand these principles, it will help you to understand the next story that we're going to look into. Because Jesus describes there the most shameful characters that you would have found in that time. Now let's look at verse 11 and pick that story up. The parable. Verse 11. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told him the story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. I want to pause there. If you understand the time that they were living in, that wasn't the practice. Maybe an older son could approach his father and say to his father, Father, I want my portion. Maybe I want to do something with it. But even then, the older son knew that he cannot do that because it was a shameful thing to do. Because in most cases, inheritance was received when the death of the father happened. The older son would receive two-thirds. The younger son would receive one-thirds. And so we see this shameful thing that the younger son is doing. Now, verse 12 Towards the end, we see something that a father does that was also shameful. Father says, he agreed to divide his wealth between his two sons. During that time, a father who had a status in society, a father who was looked up to, he was a businessman or he was an owner of a large estate, he didn't just throw his honor down. He had every right to take that son, whip him, teach him a lesson, and possibly give him a boot and say, go think about what you just did. But the father doesn't do that. The father takes the shame. He puts his honor aside and he says, I'll divide it. The third character is the older brother who 
also did what most wouldn't do. He doesn't exist in a sense. He didn't come and protect his family's name and said to his younger brother, what are you doing? Because that shame would fall upon him as well. No, he is nowhere to be found in that conversation. Where was he? We pick it back up at 13. A few days later, a younger son packed up all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. Now just think about this. The Bible is very clear that it was a few days. Now you cannot sell an estate in a few days. In a normal market. What you have to do is you more than likely have to discount it to the point where it's worth half or even less for someone to come in and to take the risk and buy it. I clearly told that he didn't care about what he was receiving in the sense. He sold it at a very cheap price, at a very discounted price and left. He thought that his life was under his control. He was his own boss and he did what he wanted. But we see in verse 14, that wasn't the case. About the time that his money ran out, a great famine sweeped over the land and he began to starve. Now famine is something that we probably, my generation, we've never experienced it. But I know that there's people in this congregation that have gone through hunger. They know what it is to eat something that necessarily isn't pleasurable or it simply doesn't taste good or there's nothing to eat. But famine during that time was a very serious thing. You had to quickly come to the senses. You had to preserve. You had to do everything you can to survive because you didn't know how long it's going to last. During that time, most people made their belts, their shoes out of leather, and they even ate those if they had to. They would boil them, create a broth, drink it, to be able to feed themselves. So this was a serious thing. This wasn't just something that, there wasn't a little bit of food for two days. There was no food. Verse 15, he persuaded a local farmer I'm sorry, verse 14, about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into a field to feed the pigs. Now persuaded is a very, depending on the translation you look at, there's others that say he almost stuck himself to someone. He pretty much became so annoying that a farmer basically said, go, go feed Go look after my pigs. Have you ever experienced that in your life when maybe your child wants something and they beg and beg and beg and you hand it to them and even though it's not a good thing, but it just, there's peace. He got to a point where he had nothing. No dignity, no friends, no food. A big nothing. He's going to die if he doesn't change something about himself or his situation. It was serious. Verse 16. The young man became so hungry that even the pods that he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. Not only was he with the pigs. He himself became a pig. Jesus wanted to illustrate by this parable that this was the worst sinner that you can get during that time. Someone who completely went astray, who left the father, the protection of the home. He left his faith and God himself. He had no fear for him. He received the freedom of the will that ultimately led him to a bondage of sin that he was found in. And dear friend, maybe today you're seeking the same thing. You're seeking the freedom of the will to do what I want, do as I say, I know what I'm doing. Just remember, ultimately, it could lead you 
to a bondage of sin, and you might not even be ready for it. Verse 17, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even hired servants, I want you to highlight that, have food, have enough food to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. A hired servant was different than a slave. Hired servant was someone who a master went and hired for a day. It was someone that maybe you've seen in parts of America that people stand on the corners of the streets to get work for the day and then they get dropped off. Those were the people that he's talking about. And it's important that you understand that because they even had bread, they had water. And here he is with nothing. Verse 18, I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me as a hired servant. Remember that. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long ways away, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Now, if we go back again to that time, a father who was carrying something that represented honor, something that was looked after, even also culturally speaking, man did not run at that time. Because in order for you to run, you had to lift up your I'm not sure what the proper name is. It's a, not a skirt, but it was a type of, not pants. You had to lift it. You had to expose your feet. And so his father takes the shame from his son and puts it on himself, and he runs to his son. He ran at full speed, and that shame came on him. God runs to us today when we are full of garbage, when we think we're not worthy enough, when we make that decision, we turn away. It's a very important step. We must turn, reflect, make a U-turn. He runs to us. Notice in verse 21, his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Hired servant doesn't come up there. He wanted to tell that to his father. And he speaks. But it's no longer there. Verse 22, but his father said to, us, to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe to the, in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. He receives complete grace. When we are forgiven and accepted by God, he gives us full honor back. We're no longer hired servants, but we're his children. We serve him with joy. Verse 23, and kill a calf that has been fattened, we must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead, and now he returned to life. He was lost, but now he was found. So the party began. Now, if you understand Middle East during that time, depending on religion and the culture where you're in, if a son left in a disrespectful way, they had a funeral. And some religions still do that. They bury their child in a sense. He's no longer there. He's gone. Don't even remember him. It's symbolic, but it's so wonderful to see this representation here. Verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was at the field working. When he returned home, he heard the music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of his servants, what is going on? Your brother is back, he was told. And your father has killed a fattened calf, 
We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. God sent his son to demonstrate his love for us and to believe in Jesus and to turn away from our sins. And he begs us to hear that, apply that, not every day is a prodigal son, daughter. Are they prodigal or are they disobedient? They can simply be religious hypocrites. He was referring to obviously the Pharisees. But I want to say something that the, the son, he wasn't found there. He had no relationship with his father. How often are we part of a church maybe for many years and we do this and do that. We come there, but we don't have that personal relationship. We do not see the importance of what's being done because it is about us. Verse 29, but he replied, all these years I have slaved for you and not one and Never once refused to do a single thing that you told me. And in all that time, you never gave me even a young goat for a feast with my friends. What he was saying was, what about me? Me. He's angry. He wants to hear nothing about his younger brother. You know, often we find the same attitude amongst groups. Amongst leaders, amongst friendships, maybe owners of a business where your employees will come in and they'll complain and complain. What about me? They don't see the bigger picture. They want now results. Me. Yet when the son of yours, yet when this son of yours comes back after being astray, spending your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing a fattened calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. You have to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and he has come back to life. He was lost, but now he has found. He's been found. Your friend our Heavenly Father rejoice, and He cannot restrain that when a sinner comes to repent. This parable is an amazing example of grace that He has shown and shows to us. We looked at three different characters younger son, father, older son. Maybe today you are like the younger son. Where are you? Where are you running to? Where are you going? And what destination are you trying to reach? Maybe you're like the father who has taken shame on himself for your children, for the things that you do, for the ministry that you carry on your shoulders. And you're looking for that opportunity to make peace or maybe to reach something or someone, stay faithful. Don't worry about the shame. Maybe you're like the older son and you've been part of a church for many years. You've been walking in faith for many years, but you don't have a personal relationship with the Lord. Christ isn't your savior. He's just a destination. I want to encourage for those that are walking with Jesus, for those that have left their old behind, taken the new. We're going to open to Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off everything that weighs us down and slows us down, especially the sin that is so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiated the perfect, who perfects our faith. Highlight this because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding the shame. Now he's seated at the place of honor besides God's throne. My brother, my sister, my friend, what is your final destination today? What are you running? What are you trying to achieve? What joy are you looking for? Because the joy that really matters is to be found with Jesus one day. Disregard that shame, throw it away. It has no value. It won't get you anywhere. It will only lead you to eternal death. Let us stand and pray.